so we're going to get started. Um, just five minutes late here, getting underway. Um, this is the big transition section. This is what kind of what I've been waiting for. Another sort of uh, meat on the bones talk, so to speak. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a 10 minute or so background introduction with some local data, um, some provincial data actually on transitions. Um, and uh, after that, we've got a panel of um, patients um, here to speak to us about some of the transitions that they've had in their kidney patient journeys. Um, I'll just take a moment to uh, introduce them briefly before I get started on my talk, and then um, we'll hear from Sushila first and Gurjeet thereafter. So if you want to just give a wave, Sushila, so everyone knows who you are. So Sheila's a mother, she has two children, she has two grandchildren, and she lives in Abbotsford. She was diagnosed with kidney disease in 1997, and uh, she developed end-stage kidney failure in 2001. She had her first transplant in 2009, so she was on dialysis for eight years, um, and unfortunately that transplant wasn't successful. And her second transplant came in 2015, and she's had good success with that. So we'll hear a little bit more about her voyage shortly. Um, Gurjeet, some of you may know, and in fact may work with Gurjeet. Um, she is a graduate of nursing school, and uh, she has uh, seen both sides of the spectrum here, patient uh, side and health professional side. So we look forward to hearing your story as well. So I'm going to get started then with some of our data. You don't have to read this slide. I was just brainstorming transitions. I think you know, you'll probably able, be able to think of far more transitions than that. There's major life transitions, and there's major disease um, transitions, major social transitions. Um, but what we're really going to focus on is the transitions in the care that we provide. Looking at the literature on this, because I wasn't familiar with it, um, and indeed there's not a big literature on it, um, the, the bulk of the literature, I would say, not surprisingly, is for patients progressing from pre-dialysis to dialysis care, so readying those patients, trying to predict when that transition might come. Um, there's various calculators that are coming out right now, and I think this is really an area that warrants uh, a lot more attention. Um, there's also a bit of information about um, transplant and pr timing of preemptive transplant or failure of transplant and return to dialysis. Um, there's a growing literature, it seems, on the incorporation of palliative care principles as well um, into uh, um, patients that perhaps choose the conservative care pathway or choose to palliate. Um, and I think that's been a really worthwhile contribution as well, and it certainly shaped my thinking about goals of care and just trying to stay focused when we're dealing with patients that have such a challenging um, disease burden and problem list. Um, there's a general acceptance of sort of social science type literature um, that transitions are challenging. And then there's emerging concept of seamless care, and um, also there's some consensus um, in some areas of what uh, patient education and what a transition should look like. But after reviewing all this, it, I really have major questions still. How many transitions are we talking about? And at what stages are these transitions happening? What defines an effective transition? And what sort of care inputs are needed for that? And how would we measure the effectiveness of a transition? Including how many should occur? You know, how many patients are we missing on in-center dialysis, for example, who could be at home? So here's your first polling question. And I, I can't wait to see what you're gonna say. What percent of prevalent dialysis patients in BC undergo at least one transition to a different ESRD modality yearly? So that could be a transition to transplant. That could be a transition to, from hemo to PD, from PD to hemo, from hemo to home hemo, et cetera. So how, how many are we talking about? Wow. OK, I'm surprised by that. Um, in fact, the number is, you guys are actually pretty good. Um, I thought you might underestimate the number, but um, we're just waiting for those final numbers to come in. The number is between 15 and 20 percent. So again, when we were planning, I was thinking about transitions, and 
I, I just stopped and realized we're doing this all the time, aren't we? We're, we have a patient in front of us and we're wondering if they should be on a home treatment. They may be coming to the end of their home treatment and thinking, can we get them to another home treatment or how are we going to get them in, you know, back onto hemodialysis or how are we going to get them to transplant? And it just seems like in every session you're kind of searching for something better or, or planning out the next stage. So we looked in um, our data in BC, and I'm going to take a minute to explain what we did here. We looked at five yearly cohorts, so from April to April of each year. And we divided the patients into active and inactive. I'll just summarize it by saying about um, a tenth to a fifth of them, uh, sorry, 10 to 20 percent of them were inactive, but um, we looked at the active cohort. And we looked at permanent transition. So if someone came into hospital, let's say a PD patient with uh, peritonitis, or, and they needed their PD tube out and to go on temporary hemodialysis, and then they were discharged and subsequently went back onto hemo, that's not considered a permanent transition. This is a this is a one-way transition. Um, and um, the three different groups that we looked at, um, facility-based hemo is in-center and community dialysis units combined. And then there's home hemo and PD. So let's look at our numbers. You don't need to look at or process these numbers. I'm going to show it to you in graph form in just a moment. But as you march along um, the top of the slide, you can just see the yearly cohorts from 2011 to 2015. Um, and then the numbers that are active and, and inactive. So there's some not surprising information here. By far and away, the largest part of our cohort are the center and community-based hemodialysis patients expected um, prevalence on PD and home hemo. Another thing I think to note is that these numbers are surprisingly static over time. Um, so this is not transitions, this is just prevalent, the absolute numbers of patients that we're dealing with. So th these are our de denominators. This is the number of transitions, but we're going to talk about it this way. So again, marching along the slide, uh, along the x-axis, you've got your year-by-year -year cohort and then the percent. So we're looking at the percentage of patients by number of transitions between modalities within a year. So the majority is zero. But uh, you, you, there were some who had uh, very busy years indeed, uh, three transitions. So you know that might have been someone who started off on, on center hemodialysis and went to PD and maybe they had a transplant and uh, you know there's all sorts of permutations. But, um, the majority of patients who had a transition had one transition. Um, and you can see that um, if you look at one modality, again, just as I'd mentioned, like if you look at only the PD patients and then only the home hemo patients, the number of transitions per year, the percentage, is really quite static. So we're going to talk about what I've termed destination modality, meaning what dialysis or treatment modality do they move to? Where do they start and where do they move to? So again, going along by year, those who started on PD, they could have gone to transplant, they could have gone to home hemo, they could have gone to facility dialysis. And uh, it's disappointing to see how low that red bar is. At least it certainly was for me. Um, nice to see how many are getting transplanted and probably not surprising to anybody in this room how many are going to facility hemodialysis. When we look at the same thing for home hemo to other, it tells the, basically the same story. Many of them are getting transplanted. Most of them are ending up in facility hemodialysis. And we've got, a, I think, um, a population that we may be able to work on here, a really small number transitioning to another home therapy. When we look at those patients who are in a facility-based hemodialysis going to other, again, transplant is the main number, and it's nice to see how many transplants there were. Um, and again, not surprisingly, we're capturing more on PD. This reflects our prevalence uh, rates on these modalities, more on PD than on home hemo. I thought I'd just mine this, just to crystallize this, um, that looking at the transitions from facility hemo to independent modality is, again, a small proportion, a very small proportion, and a very static number. So I think despite all our efforts to promote home treatments, um, to uh, provide information, to support patients, navigators, etc. 
how can we move this beyond 3%? And what's an ideal number? I, I, we certainly don't have that information yet, but I think we need to look at this uh, a little bit more. So transitional care, actions designed to ensure coordination, continuity of health care during transitions. We have a lot of resources in BC, and I think we're tremendously lucky. And we heard about a lot of these resources already. You're familiar with these, so I won't go into them in any detail. But I do just want to ask you, as we're going to transition to hearing from the patients, another question. What transition resource do you think would be most helpful for patients in making a decision to change modality? Would it be um, input from the team, learning sessions, videos or other pamphlets, peer support, or all of the above? I hope, I hope there's 100% on one answer here. <laughs> Pretty much there is. Good job. Okay, and so we'll hear the relative contributions of these um, from our patients of how this uh, was helpful. I have, um, I'll just go to one uh, final slide. The experts um, that have put together their uh, opinion of what ideal uh, transition care should look like, they use a lot of, uh, like a really multidisciplinary approach. They've got a, a health information tool where they have risk prediction equations, they have patients logging on, they have patients accessing their lab data, becoming involved in their treatment. They had this notion of a kidney transition specialist, and I don't fully understand how that differs from a navigator nurse, but I'd be interested in a few future meeting and maybe having one of these people come and chat with us. One, another initiative that I thought was really good was um, they have a, a formal training program. Um, actually, it started off for nephrology trainees. Um, because the trainees said, we don't know how to counsel patients in this manner. And I think we all have to be very adept at this skill because um, clearly we're dealing with a lot of transitions. So the red light is beeping in front of me, and uh, the patients are ready to go. So I'd like to welcome Sushila to come and say a few words. Please welcome her. Well, hello there, everyone. As you know, my name is Sushila Naker. I'm from Abbotsford, originally from Surrey. Um, I'm going to share my story with you. It consists with um, 15 years of dialysis, one failed transplant, and the most recent one was a successful one. So I'm happy about that. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, chronic renal failure in 1997. Three years later, I went into total kidney failure, started dialysis in 2001. Um, I have a B positive blood type, so I was told that it would take me about eight years to get a possible transplant. And I was okay with it because I was doing dialysis fine, everything was going good. Um, my renal team always encouraged me to be involved in my care, to take recommendations from them, how to uh, follow the renal diet, and exercise, fluid limits, all that. So I followed it, and I found myself doing pretty well. So um, in 2009, I got the phone call that I had been waiting for. There was a possible kidney available for me. So I was very excited, and I went ahead to St. Paul's to get my kidney and I was transplanted that day. Unfortunately, that kidney didn't work from the beginning, but my doctors never gave up. They tried to make it work and waited for the kidney to kick in for seven days, and it never did. So they had to make a decision to have it removed. So the kidney was removed, and I was put back on a waiting list. But um, the transplant team had a discussion with me and told me that it would be very hard for me to find a match because of my B-positive blood type. And secondly, because I had that kidney in me, so there was lots of antibodies. But I didn't lose hope. I knew that if it was God's will, I'd get a kidney. So I kept going on. 
And dialysis was again working good. And uh, in 2015, in January, I went to meet with the transplant team at St. Paul's Hospital. And um, I had a talk with Dr. Lensberg. And he very openly and honestly told me that there was very slim chance of me getting a kidney because I had these two issues against me, my blood type and the antibodies. And I was devastated. But then he said to me, you know, Mrs. Nyker, I don't want to go let you go home without any hope. So I'm going to give you a little bit of hope. And he said, there is a program that we have that uh, you can be um, a recipient from Canada wide, from other provinces. Um, I was classed as a highly sensitized patient. So with that little hope, I went home. And um, if anybody knows me, they know I don't give up that easily. So as a Christian, I anchored down to my hope and my faith that one day that miracle kidney would come my way. So that was in January of 2015. In February of 20, 20th of February, I got a call from St. Paul's saying that there was a kidney available for me and that I should go to St. Paul's. And with so much excitement, my kids drove me to St. Paul's. And um, there was a little bit of fear in me that it's going to happen to me again. But then I told myself, no, it couldn't happen to me twice. So <laughs> I refused to take it. But then um, the doctor that met me there, she told me, she said, don't get too excited because things still could go wrong. But I smiled and I said, yeah, but I don't believe that. I said, I'm here. It's for a reason, right? So anyway, I was transplanted that night. And right away, the kidneys started working. And uh, I'm a woman of faith. So the kidneys started working, and it was working really good. Everything was going great. It's been a year and a half. And um, I've been going for my post-transplant um, clinic every month. And the blood work looks good. Everything is fine. I'm telling you my story here just so anybody that doesn't, anybody that goes through challenges in life, whether it's a disease or anything else, there's always hope. And I don't want them to lose that hope because you have to hold on to it no matter what. In the midst of all this happening in my life for the last 15 years, I lost the love of my life. And I had to pick up and start again. So that's my story. And I'm so thankful that the kidney came my way and that it's working because I have so much to look forward to. I have two grandchildren. I have two beautiful children. I have so much freedom now that I can focus on. And I thank all the medical staff that has been involved in my care from the place I started at Surrey Memorial Hospital or the renal staff, to Newton Community Dialysis, to um, Abbotsford Community Dialysis, and Abbotsford Regional Hospital, and my St. Paul's team. I'm just so touched by all the people that I have met, and I'm so thankful for everything they do for me every time I go. I'm so blessed to know these people. They're professionals. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my story with you all. God bless you. My name is Gurjeet. Um, I just want to start, it off, start off by saying I'm super nervous, so don't mind my shaking or the frog in my throat right now. Um, <clears throat> so I have a few pictures to incorporate with my presentation just to kind of give you guys a, 
a look at what I looked like as I was going through the kidney disease. Um, so being healthy, I never really thought of what that meant until I became unhealthy. For the first 14 years of my life, I didn't have to think about it, about it at all. As kids, we were super healthy. We had nothing going on with us, just the regular playground injuries, common colds, and the chicken pox. A few months before I turned 14, I noticed that I was getting puffiness around my eyes almost every morning. As a young teenager, I felt a bit uncomfortable going to school with puffy eyes. People would stare at me and ask me what happened, and I never had an explanation. My parents had taken me to the family doctor a numerous amount of times, but he just could not figure out what was going on. Eventually, he sent us off to the pediatrician to get an allergy test done. I remember this day so clearly. Both my brothers and I got our allergy test done. I remember the itchiness on our back. I remember making, us mom take, making our mom take us to McDonald's and get the works, just in case our test showed that we were allergic to cheeseburger and fries. <laughs> that night, we were having a family movie night. My parents were sitting on the couch when the phone rang. It was the pediatrician calling. That moment was the moment our lives changed forever. The pediatrician had told my mom that he need, she needed to bring me in as soon as possible the next morning. The next day, we went into the pediatrician and he had informed my parents that something was going on with my kidneys. The urine test he did had showed that there was an extensive amount of protein leaking out. We had no idea what that meant. My main concern was still, what were my allergies? What am I allowed to eat? What am I not allowed to eat? But he told me, don't worry about that. And he had said that I was fortunate I came in when I did. And he said that a specialist was going to see me at Children's Hospital. From that day forward, I had so many people looking after me. The clinic at Children's Hospital, the pediatrician, and my family doctor. The first thing I had to get done was a biopsy. I remember going in like a trooper, thinking it was going to be nothing, and waking up crying. I just remember my dad looking at me, heartbroken, trying to comfort me and tell me everything was going to be OK. But I don't even think he he knew whether or not it was going to be OK. After the biopsy, I don't remember actually knowing what was happening. I just remember living through it. It was a constant cycle of doctor's appointments, pharmacy visits, blood tests, and hospital stays. It ended up that I had nephrotic syndrome. Within a couple of months of being diagno diagnosed, there were big changes in both my life and my family's life. I was temporarily pulled out of school and started being homeschooled because the medication I was taking was suppressing my immune system. Homeschooling was an entirely different process. I missed my friends so much, and I was constantly trying to find things to do with my day. While being on my medication, my appearance was a big change. It didn't really bother me until people started pointing it out. As a side effect of my medication, my face had become round and moon-shaped, and people were always asking me and staring at me and wondering what happened. I will, I will always remember my math teacher's reaction when I went in to drop off a note. He asked me in front of the class while he was giggling what was wrong with me and why I looked like that. That was the only day my feelings were hurt. Otherwise, I thought for a 14-year-old, I was a pretty tough cookie to, get, to brush off all those comments. Another big adjustment was having to constantly record what I was eating. Oh, it's not working. Oh, there. Um, how much I was peeing, what medications I was taking, what my blood pressure was, and dipping my urine. I didn't know any other 14-year-old that had to do any of this. I never understood why I was doing it. I just was. The low-salt, high-protein diet was a big change as well. My family cut salt out of my diet cold turkey. All of the food tasted so bland. Another change was constantly getting poked. It was so bad that I eventually developed a bit of anxiety when I had to go to the lab to get my blood work done. I don't know why I kept these flow sheets, but those are my actual flow sheets. <laughs> the individual who was impacted the most by my diagnosis was not me, but my mom. She was doing everything for me. She would time my meds, this one on an empty stomach, this one with food, 13 pills of prednisone today, 10 pills tomorrow. As she became more and more involved in my care, she slowly started to lose herself. I noticed that she was not the same talkative person she was before. She stopped going into our family-owned business and rarely responded when we, were when we were talking to her. I remember going into my room and just seeing her sitting on the bed, staring blankly at the wall. I didn't know what to do, and my dad was always at work, and he just thought she was trying to adjust to my diagnosis. I remember going into my pediatrician's office for an appointment with my mom and thinking to myself, today, I'm going to tell him about mom. She was sitting there quiet while I was getting assessed. I paused. Do I tell him about mom? Like, it's kind of embarrassing. Why doesn't my mom talk? What's wrong with her? For some reason that day, I didn't have the courage to tell him. Eventually, she became so ill that she had to be hospitalized. This was the day after Christmas. 
She completely shut down and had to be admitted for months. I didn't have the strength to go see her right away, but I do remember the first time I went in, I completely broke down. Slowly, things started to fall apart. Although my mom was physically there, she wasn't around when I needed her most. We had to sell our family business that she had worked so unbelievably hard to open, and I had to temporarily move into my aunt's house because there would be nobody at home to look after me while my brothers were at school and my dad was at work. As I got older, I became a bit more independent. When I got my license, I started driving myself to my appointments at Children's Hospital. Up until that day, my dad, was, my dad had been taking me, but I thought I was ready to take this on myself. I remember the first time when I was driving there, I got lost. I totally went the opposite way, and it took me an extra hour to get where I was going, and I was so panicked. I had never driven to Vancouver myself. Perhaps I was a little bit too eager to start being independent. Children's Hospital was actually great. I didn't mind going there. Everyone was so nice, and they were so helpful. Near the end of high school, I started to change. I convinced myself that I was feeling fine and stopped using the flow sheets and would skip appointments at the hospital. It wasn't hard to convince myself I was feeling fine because I actually was feeling fine. At this point, all my parents knew about my disease is what I told them. I told them how I was feeling, which was fine. I graduated high school and was ready for the next transition in my life, which was going to college. <clears throat> I was still going into most of my appointments at Children's. I skipped a few months at a time, but I didn't think anything of it. One day, I received a phone call. I, told, I was told that because I turned 18, I was not going to be coming there anymore. I was so devastated. I even begged for them to let me see them one more time, but rules were rules. The transfer from Children's Hospital to my community nephrologist was probably one of the hardest transitions in my life. Children's had this big team of people looking out for you, and you were always in this bright building with colorful walls. But then when I turned 18, it was time to leave. I didn't even know who I was going to see. It was really nerve-wracking. In fact, I skipped my first appointment. The second one I went to, and I remember sitting in this old building with old people that had pamphlets of stuff I had no idea what was on them. I got called into the office, and the nephrologist asked, so what's going on? And I just remember, I, I just remember saying, I, don't, I didn't know what to say. I just remember I kept answering, I'm fine, or everything's good. I was thinking, you're the doctor, shouldn't you know what's going on? All I could tell him was my na the name of my disease and I had nothing else to say. It was probably one of the other worst experiences I went through. I went from this bright building to this dark building and having to tell a stranger about this disease that I actually didn't know much about. After that day, I decided I was fine and, I was probably, and probably didn't have to go back for a long time. I did occasional blood work and no follow-up. I took my meds for a bit, but I eventually convinced myself I was okay and didn't have to take those big honking pills of cyclophosphamide. I continued on with life, feeling well, still following the diet because I had somewhat come accustomed to it. I didn't share anything with my mom because I was worried about her becoming sick and my dad thought everything was going well because he trusted me and I did feel fine, so that's what I would tell him. My brothers were too young to understand what was going on when it all started, so as we grew up, we just never talked about the disease. Kidney disease really is silent. In fact, it's so silent that I was able to keep moving forward with the next few years of my life feeling extremely well. I went on trips with my friends, I went to school, and I did everything everyone else was doing with no worries in the world. But in the back of my mind, I knew I had kidney disease, and I knew it was something. But I don't know what made me decide not to comply with blood work and my medications. I know I was smarter than that. Was I in denial, or was it just that I didn't understand the importance of these bean-shaped organs? I really don't remember the answer to those questions. What I do remember is knowing that something was wrong, and I do remember thinking of the word dying, and I do remember wondering what my future was gonna look like. In fact, I remember when I was 19, this guy wanted to date me, and I told him, trust me, you don't wanna date me, I have baggage. I don't know what 19-year-old has baggage, but apparently I thought I did. I told him about my disease and how I read online that I, probably, I, I would probably die at a young age. At that time, I trusted almost everything on Google. I know better now. <laughs> for some reason, he still wanted to date me. He was so persistent, and I eventually fell for him. I would have to admit that he was quite the charmer. Then I turned 21, and I decided I need to go back to see my doctor. I called in and made an appointment with this receptionist. I knew her name off by heart because she had tried to call me so many times to book an appointment. <laughs> Sometimes I would have said yes and not shown up, and other times I would have just not answered. I went in because I thought I was ready to face this disease head on. Little did I know it was too late. 
It had never even crossed my mind that it could be too late to fix. I didn't even know what needed fixing. At that appointment, he had told me that my kidney function has dropped drastically and he had to re-biopsy me, which he did. <coughs> the biopsy results were not good. So as I finally transitioned into seeing my nephrologist in his office, it was time for me to transfer to another team at the kidney care clinic. I mean, it wasn't too difficult of a transition because I got to keep the same doctor. I got to know him a bit better and realized that he was a pretty nice guy. The difficult part of the transition was knowing that I'm here because there's absolutely nothing else that can be done. The medications were no longer going to work and I was just going to be playing the waiting game. I was frustrated and I just felt so lost. I had this one nurse there that was really nice and caring. She went above and beyond to make sure I was doing okay and that felt comforting. She was the only healthcare team member I would ever told about my mom or anything personal because she took the time out to get to know me and not just my disease. My kidney function had, to, had continued to drop and the team was ready to convince me to do dialysis. Dialysis, I couldn't even bring myself to learn about what it was, let alone start on it. Overall, I felt pretty good and couldn't comprehend why they kept saying it was time to start. I convinced my nephrologist I was fine and he, he let me continue to wait. However, I did agree to go to the hospital and learn about dialysis. That had to be another one of the worst experiences in my life. I remember going in by myself, sitting in a room, and watching a video about dialysis. I was so mad and frustrated watching all these old people make it look like dialysis was so easy and good for their lives. I wasn't old, I was only 21, and I couldn't relate to them. I remember just sitting there, calling my friend and talking to her and telling, me how mad I was, telling her how mad I was. At 22, I had just finished my diploma and started working. I knew my future was unsteady, but I had no idea how fast things could change. I got this phone call while I was at work, and it was my nurse telling me I had to start dialysis. I didn't want to. I prolonged it for so long, but she said my kidney function had dropped to eight, and there were no other options. They had asked me for a meeting, and this was the first time I actually took in my dad and my brothers. It took my dad and my brothers into the clinic, and I just started crying. I didn't know what dialysis consisted of. I never got the courage to look it up or learn about it. I just was so upset. I kept going, going along with the look good, feel good scenario I had in my mind and never thought dialysis would happen to me. One thing after another happened. I got a phone call telling me that the tube was scheduled to be put in. The part, this part was a bit of a blur. I don't remember actually knowing what was going to happen. I just remember them giving me a date. The weekend right before the tube was put in, Myself and five of my friends went away for a mini vacation, acting like it was my last hurrah before my life completely changed. We had a blast, it was so much fun and I still felt fine, which to me was a little bit deceiving. At 23, at 23 the tube was, into my, was put into my belly. It was so painful, I actually passed out. I feel really bad for my nurse. My brother and his girlfriend had brought me in and stayed around the hospital while the procedure was going on. After the tube was put in, I was home every day. My only objective in life at that point became to defeat all the levels in Super Mario Brothers, which I did. <laughs> Having a tube come out of my belly was really weird. My first thought wasn't about how I was going to do the dialysis, but more so, how am I gonna go to the beach? How am I gonna go swimming? How am I ever gonna wear a bathing suit again? I thought to myself that I'm never gonna get to do that stuff again because of this tube that's coming out of my belly. During my first dialysis, first trial of dialysis, my friend, I forgot to forward through, guys, sorry. Uh, During my first trial of dialysis, my fr best friend went in with me and spent the full eight hours keeping me company. I'm glad she came with me because the population in the room consisted of people who were way older than me. Dialysis started and I went on with life. I learned how to work around it. I would sometimes be that crazy girl that would um, stare, I would be that crazy girl that people would stare at because I had a PD bag hanging from the coat rack in my car while going downtown for a girl's night. I traveled a little bit with, PD, with the PD machine and went back to school to finish my degree. I just made the best of the situation I was in. I'll be honest, I didn't always take my supplements or binders, but one thing I knew for sure was that I was not to skip the dialysis, so I never did. While I was on dialysis, I started volunteering with the Kidney Foundation. This was an, a rewarding experience. I went to the kidney walks with my friends and family and we met other people that were going through the same thing as I was. We raised money for the Kidney Foundation and we advocated for organ donation, which was a really good feeling. Up until my second year into dialysis, I didn't really think about transplant. 
I knew I was on a wait list of some sort, and I remember saying, I don't want to talk about living donors, a donation, because I was, it was so uncomfortable, and I couldn't imagine anyone else going through surgery for me. I didn't know enough about it, and, I, and it didn't make sense to me that someone could donate their kidney. But then I kind of started feeling crappy, and then I started thinking about my future. Was this going to be the rest of my life, attached to a machine, and not being able to live it to the fullest? This can't be the way that things are supposed to turn out. So my boyfriend and I started asking more questions and researching on the internet. My mom had decided to get tested, but she was not able to donate due to her health conditions. And nobody else in my family matched my blood type. I was lost. We even started looking overseas, but ethically, I couldn't bring myself to take that route. Through volunteering, I learned about the Parrot Exchange program. A friend I had made through social media had decided to donate her kidney to me, and I was super stoked. There ended up being a match, and we were set for the transplant in February 2012. I was so excited, I was in the middle of my degree program, I worked my butt off to make sure I was able to get the transplant and continue going back to school when I'm done. I told my friends and family, everyone was so excited. We could see this bright future ahead, and we were just so overwhelmed with excitement. <laughs> Two weeks before the transplant, I had just pulled into my driveway after school and received a phone call from the transplant nurse. She had told me that the transplant wasn't going to go through. I had, pulled out, I had been pulled out of the chain and had no reason behind it. I was so upset I couldn't believe this had happened. That day was devastating and telling my mom was the worst part. Up until now, I had tried to hide everything from her, but this I just couldn't. She just kept saying, I don't understand, and I had no answers to give her because at that point, I didn't understand myself. It was tough to swallow, but after a couple of weeks, I decided I couldn't change the outcome and continued on with my life. Down the road, I met this couple at the kidney walk, and they had told me another method for organ donation. They weren't the same blood type, but the wife was able to donate to her husband through a special procedure. Once I found out about that, I called the transplant team, and after a bit of back and forth communication, we finally met. My brothers were already ready to donate, and the older one was the one that got picked. He had gotten married that summer, and in the fall, he took time off and planned his schedule, knowing that he was go going to donate. So now, Almost after almost being on dialysis for four years, I was going to get my transplant. The transplant was scheduled for mid-November. My brother had planned ahead of time and was ready to donate. At the end of October, I got a phone call from the transplant team saying that there was a match that was found in the Parrot Exchange program and my boyfriend was that match. I was actually really upset because now I felt I had to make this decision about transplant through my boyfriend or, the Parrot, or through my brother. The Parrot Exchange program had, program had already fallen apart before and I decided that my brother would probably be the best option for me. And also, if anything were to go wrong, at least we come from the same family and I don't have to worry about somebody else's parents being devastated. But that persistent boyfriend of mine, who chased me back when I was 19, decided he was the right choice and begged to go through the Parrot Exchange program and donate. He convinced me. The night before the surgery, he came to the hospital and stayed with me even though he didn't have to come in until the next morning. The morning of transplant, he was going in first, so I walked him down and started to get really emotional. I felt this guilty feeling in the pit of my stomach. I felt bad that he was doing this for me. What if something happened to him? A few hours later, I went in. The transplant went well. We spent the holiday season recovering together, having Skype dates, making gingerbread houses, and binge-watching shows on Netflix. Transplant was a new chapter with a different team following us. This transition was a little bit easier, but it did have some bumps in the road before I got fully adjusted. Not knowing what your kidney function is after transplant beforehand is a little devastating when you find out it's at 40% afterwards. But then you get taught that that's just how it is, and you monitor your creatinine and not your kidney function. I know that the transplant is just a treatment and not a cure, but I hope I get to keep this bean-shaped organ for a very long time. Since transplant, we became actively involved with BC Transplant and have made so many transplant friends. And I would have to say advocating for organ donation is such an award, a reward. I, I got engaged to my lifesaver, finished my degree, and became a renal nurse. I got married, and we both traveled through Europe. These past 15 years have been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, but I'm so grateful that I'm able to stand here today and tell you my story. I was able to tell you this story in a little less than 4,000 words. <laughs> this was just a bit of my journey through kidney disease. 
I hope it has shown you that sometimes there are many things that go on in an individual's life that impact the way they deal with their disease. And it's important to take that into consideration when caring for our patient population. I thank you for listening to our story, or my story. Terrific stories and great storytelling. Thank you both so much. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, and nobody has submitted a question. Come on. There's so much going on here. I have questions, but I hate to be the only one asking. Perfect. Well, after 45 years, I didn't think I'd see two patients of mine up on the podium. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I knew I knew that uh, Shishila Naika had a strong voice all along, even when, when she was uh, being dialyzed. But uh, your words today certainly have given me a lot of encouragement. You know, talk talk about burnout. I mean, 45 years is a long time. <laughs> but I, I thank you both for sharing your stories in, in such a vigorous way. Thank you so much. question, actually, perhaps I can pose the same question to each of you, and maybe we can start with Sushila. Um, if there was one thing, when you look back along your voyage, that you think may have been a missed care opportunity in one of your transitions, what do you think that might be? Could you repeat a way, that, a way that one of your transitions could have been made easier, your transition onto dialysis, um, you know, the, the first transplant not working out was heartbreaking. I'm not sure anyone could substitute that outcome, but was there some way that the team might have helped either expedite something for you or helped you for, cope with it better? Personally, me, yeah. I, I don't think there was anything that could have been made, could have made a difference to me because I come from the medical background, so I understood what dialysis was and um, even the rejection I understood the process, but there are patients that come for dialysis who doesn't know anything about dialysis. Like, it's an overwhelming experience. So for them, I would say a little bit of teaching and um, getting the patients to be involved in their care is the most important thing. Because um, for me personally, when Dr. Chan described the two kinds of dialysis for me, I right away chose hemo because I didn't want to take dialysis home with me. Right. To me, positive thinking was the most important thing. If I took dialysis home, that means I have a disease. So I'd rather choose, do dialysis at the hospital, leave everything behind, go home, and that's it. You're done. You don't bring it home. That's how I chose it, right? right. But for other people, some elderly people come to dialysis. Like I had a chance of meeting these new patients in the waiting room in the hospitals who don't know anything what, of what they're going through or what's going to be the process. And they are just scared, overwhelmed, and, you know, sometimes they decide they don't want to do dialysis. So that would be one thing that I would stress upon, that education before somebody starts dialysis. Seems a large part of that education is really engaging the patient as well because yeah. I mean we have those materials out there it's on the website people could could find it and hopefully we can convey to them where they might find it but but how to make that step and engage and that was a theme um, Gurjeet for you with your transition certainly from um, Children's Hospital um, if, if you could find I'll ask the same question to you then Gurjeet one one way that we could have done better. I think I was a little bit different because I came from children's, but, and then I was a little bit non-compliant before I left children's. Um, it probably would have been better considering my parents' background to maybe have my parents educate a little, a little bit more on my disease instead of me taking it on myself without actually knowing what I was taking on. Um, and it would have been nice to meet my nephrologist in the community before leaving children's hospital to have that feeling of comfort. Um, I mean, he was an awesome guy, but, 
when I went into that office, it was a totally different atmosphere and it was a totally different feel than Children's Hospital is. And then um, for PD, I think stuff like peer support would have been definitely beneficial because generally when you look at dialysis, you're thinking about patients that are older in the general case, but um, it would have been nice to meet somebody that had been through it or even while I was at Children, meet another patient that was going through kidney disease to kind of have that bond created to help me and help them comply and kind of figure it out together. That, that was certainly a theme that came out in, in hearing your talk was these patients don't look like me, mm -mm. or I don't yeah. look like them. Yeah, um, I just had a comment as well, and, and I made myself a little note here about um, when you really kind of hunkered down and, and took control of your, your, your issues that you brought your family in with you that mm -hmm. time. And I, I think probably a lot of us can relate to that experience that we've, you know, maybe we've been reaching out or what, how effective we were at reaching out, I don't know, but um, you know, I can certainly think of times where, okay, I think we're finally getting somewhere because the patient's wife is here this time or the patient's husband's here this time and, and now we're really going to talk. Now we really get to get into this. So how do, how do you think we might encourage family involvement? Because we don't want to step on someone's autonomy um, on the one hand um, and on the other hand we don't want to feel like you know we may be burdening the family members. How, how, how might we approach that? That's a tricky question. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that, but maybe, um, like, I don't know at what point I would have let my family get reinvolved with my care, no matter what the, like, the doctor said to me. I think I would have kept going in by myself. Be maybe that's based on what my mom went through, and I had that burden of she's sick because of me. But, I mean, um, being a nurse now, I think, I think, um, maybe some education sessions that don't necessarily involve the one-on-one -on -one care of the patient, but help, under help families understand what their child or husband or wife is going through, but not directly talk to them about it, but maybe in a group setting so they have some support. Um, otherwise, I don't really know how you can convince somebody, because sometimes you're in that mindset of, this is all me and I'm gonna take it all myself, or you're in denial, and if you're in denial, why would you bring your family in to so maybe planting the seed. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was quite a stark image that you gave of sitting by yourself watching the video. Mm -hmm. I thought that, yeah, that would be very difficult. Um, so Sheila, can you maybe help? Or do you have a suggestion for how we might engage with someone's broader family or if that's something we should be pursuing? I think in certain cases you should, but in, in some case, cases I think families do not want to be involved in the everyday care. Personally, mine got so involved, they became dialysis technicians and got in the medical field. <laughs> but, you know, there are certain people, I tried to keep them away, but they just jumped in. Awesome. Um, they just wouldn't stay away. <laughs> That's awesome. But I think for elderly people, I think family should be involved, yeah. right? So, I don't know how to approach that, though. Yeah, it's that old phrase of kidney disease affecting families, isn't it? Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Is there any final thoughts or anyone wanting to? Oh, there's some questions now. Great. Okay, so I'll, I'll just go to the number with the most queries, five. Uh, Gurjeev, um, uh, what would have helped you with adherence? We have a lot of patients who transition from children's and adherence is a major issue. Um, that was so long ago. Okay. Um, it probably, like I said, it would have been nice meeting other kids that were going through the same thing as I was. Um, then you kind of make a buddy system and maybe convince each other, today take your meds, and today, like, you're, somebody else is walking down that same road with you, so it's just, it would be good to have support, I think. Um, but it was kind of hard because I felt fine, and I, I felt fine, I looked fine, so it was hard to convince myself that I wasn't fine. And during that time, with my mom transitioning into, or getting sick herself, it was hard to even have parents tell you that, hey, make sure you do this because now other things around you were falling apart. So for me, I think um, I was in a totally different scenario, but I mean, I know kids still that are not kids, like young adults that have transplant and at the transplant clinic, they don't take their meds and no matter how much you tell them what can happen, you're not scaring them because they still feel fine. They think that I don't have to take these pills until they realize their kidney's failing and it's too late. So that's kind of a tough question to answer, I think. Um, but I think peer support would be the first thing I would suggest. 
There are four love letters for each of you from Fraser Health. So <laughs> just pass that on if you can't see those. Um, another question here was posed for Gurjeet. Uh, in your opinion, is there any way to change the dialysis environment to help improve compliance among young dialysis patients? So that's a good one, because we heard you talk about the room and the colorful room and the stark room. I'm not sure we can change those <laughs> factors in our, in our surroundings, but what other environmental things? For dialysis? Yeah. I mean, I work on the PD unit, and it's pretty, it's pretty bright. It's a nice unit, but I was young, and watching that video, I still feel bad making patients that are young watch that video because it doesn't have anything to do with where they are in life. Being able to go to the grocery store because you have a PD tube and don't have to go to the hospital and stay in the hospital it doesn't do anything for somebody that's 22 or 23 years old or maybe even 30. You're in a totally different part of your life compared to somebody that's maybe 70 or older than that. Um, but in terms of PD, I think, I think that unit is pretty well, they're pretty good and they, they do a good job, but it's more of the resources, I think. And like, I'm fortunate, this is a weird thing to say, I'm fortunate that I have gone through it. So when I do get those young people or people that are scared for the tube insertion, I'm able to walk them through it and that does make them feel comfortable. So I know off first hand that peer support probably does work. Um, because I had, I even had this young guy ask, his first, I asked him what his main concern was and he said, how am I going to do yoga? When you start dialysis, that's not probably the concern of somebody that's 65, 70. They're probably happy that there's this machine to keep them alive. Whereas when you're younger, you're not thinking about staying alive. You just want to live like your friends are living and like people your age are living. Well <laughs> All right. Uh, a couple more love letters are flowing in, so just wait a minute. 120% inspiration from a few people in the crowd, too, to carry on looking after you all and um, make this uh, as good as we can. So I think this is a theme that we should revisit in a couple years as well. Thank you both so much for sharing. Awesome.